Um, okay, so um, I think like you already basically know the drill here, and since this is basically turned into an independent study, you know, <laughs> I always feel like I need to explain the assignments to you. Um, but yeah, just make sure you do the vocab quiz on Sunday, um, and of course. The reading is what was supposed to be the reading for today, except that I screwed up. So you're going to be doing the Virginia Wolf next time. Okay, so you said you found, so you, you indicated that you found this pretty disturbing. Uh, why? <laughs> um, it was just I think it wasn't as disturbing as it was unsettling. Okay. Um, I it's like a very subtle <laughs> distinction, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I um, when I was reading it, I. Um, I liked the beginning of it. I liked that. Uh -huh. I liked how their marriage was. It, it parts of it. Because uh -huh. I was like in my head, I was like, "Damn, is this like what you have to do to have like a stable, healthy relationship?" Yeah, it's like it kind of ignoring everything. And, and then you find out it's not healthy right? at all. Yeah, and the yeah the the, the the it's essentially like you know the 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 love that's supposed to be holding all of this up, right, isn't capable of holding up this enormous structure of stuff that has to be built on top of it. Yeah. Right, you know, with children and a big house and servants and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, and then as she started to, like, go a little crazy, um, I, it was just very, like, I was, like, anxiously reading it. Like, I wanted uh -huh. to, like, like you know when you have a good book and you just want to get to the next page real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like it wasn't like it was like that good that I want. I just like I needed to know what was gonna happen, kind of. Yeah. Um, but then like I don't know. Like <laughs> I was thinking about like the way her mind was working, and I I was trying to relate to it in a sense that like. I mean, obviously, I don't have a family. I'm not married. I don't have children. Right. But like, I was trying to understand where she was coming from, and I guess like in yeah. a sense, like that, like freedom or like need to be alone. How she was just never, she could never truly be alone unless she was in those rooms. And uh -huh. even still, yeah. At first, she wasn't alone because she kept getting calls, and mm -hmm. then when she went on her her vacation, <laughs> she was bothered constantly. So yeah. she had to get Sophia. So I don't know. Uh -huh. It was, it was interesting. Yeah, it's I funny. liked this one. Yeah, it's funny. It seems like, like the only way for her to get out of the trap, right? And I think that's one thing that we need to note here is the recurrence of words like prison, cage, and bondage. Right? There's a definite strand throughout the story. Um, if you have words that refer to entrapment or imprisonment. But yeah, the, the, the only way she can think of to get out is to find somebody to replace her in the house, right? Somebody else has to be sacrificed to do it in order to give her um, you know, the, the, the freedom that she um, feels like she'll go crazy without, right? Yeah. So let me just like, kind of like give you a little bit of background context here. And to be honest, a lot of this would probably have made more sense if we'd done Wolf first, so mea culpa, right? But so, are you familiar with uh, with this Rolling Stones song that I was playing when you came in, mm -hmm. Mother's Little Helper? Okay, do you know what it's about? No. Okay. <laughs> so, in the '50s and '60s, there was this huge uptake, in, uh, uptick in suburban housewives uh, getting prescriptions for Valium if they had anxiety or uh, low-grade amphetamines if they were suffering from depression. And the interesting thing about this is not so much the, you know, the drugging, although that is actually sort of an, an, an interesting component of this, right? The solution to this was um, to simply drug these women to uh, make, their, make them feel like their situations were more tolerable. Um, but the fact that there was this huge increase in middle class women in particular suffering from depression and anxiety. 
in these you know, picture-perfect homes and picture-perfect neighborhoods with manicured lawns, good school districts, um, you know, 2.5 kids, you know, a husband going off to his job in the city every morning and coming home at night, right? Um, and something was going on that was leading to this increase in mental distress, right? And I think that there's a good, like, this song comes out around the same time as the story is written, right? So this is 1966. The story is first published in 1963. So we're, you know, it's, you know only a three-year time difference there. Um, so they're, they're clearly like, like tapping into a similar uh, feeling, a kind of similar phenomenon. Um, and Susan Rawlings, doesn't turn to drugs, doesn't even talk to a doctor or a psychologist or really anyone about what she's feeling, right? She just kind of keeps it all bottled up. And that actually might be an interesting thing to think about as well as like, you know, why she doesn't talk to anyone about these problems. I feel like she thought that had she talked to her husband, mm -hmm. he would have, they kind of would have broken that like unspoken rule of their marriage, of, like the uh -huh. like, let's just be like this like perfect, we don't have problems, we're fine. Yeah. But she even talked about like what she would say. Uh huh. Would he think she was crazy? Would he think she was irrational? Uh huh. Uh, what would he tell her to go see a doctor? What yeah. then? I think yeah, that this, this, the, the, I think that that irrational piece of this is a big part of it, right? Because remember, you know what we're told in the first sentence: their marriage is based on, right, is intelligence, right? These are reasonable people who've made rational, sensible, culturally approved choices, right? They've done everything, quote unquote, right according to the standards of their social class um, and cultural background, right? So then, if that's the case, then if Susan is unhappy, who is society going to blame for that? Yeah, and she couldn't even figure out, like, what, if he asked what's wrong, she was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, like, everything and nothing, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of similar to the way, uh, you know, shell shock sufferers, right, um, in the First World War were blamed for having a failure of nerve, right? Like, it's your fault, right, if you can't just get over it and get back out there. Um, I think, yeah, the fear is that, like, because she has this life and this stuff that other people will envy, right, or would envy, you know, when she has that conversation with the hotel woman, Miss Townsend, right, Miss Townsend clearly envies Susan's, you know, marriage to an intelligent, handsome, successful man, her big house in Richmond in the suburbs, and her four beautiful children. Right. All of this is supposed to be great, right? This is supposed to be the goal. <laughs> so why does she feel like shit? <laughs> and so, so I, I think like, like there are a couple of trends converging here in the late 50s and early 60s um, that have to do with um, both kind of the unfulfilled promises of the early feminist movement and also with changes in living in community patterns, right? And I think that those two things are related here in the tragedy of Susan Rawlings, right? So let's start with the feminist piece of this. So do you know what the difference is between first wave and second wave feminism? Um, 
the wasn't the first wave of feminism. I don't know when it was classified as. However, I do know that there like are the waves of feminism, and like each wave consisted of a certain timeline and certain like yeah. objectives and successes, or at least. So this is first wave feminism is kind of late nineteenth, early twentieth centuries. Yeah, well, Virginia Woolf is kind of a, a is kind of in between here, right? Yeah. So she's writing mostly the time when women have already achieved the basic political rights. that the first wave feminists were fighting for. So like think of like the the suffragette the suffragette movement, right? You know, the those you know women in the kind of like the round straw hats with the banners mm -hmm. uh, waving signs and marching up and down streets, right? So yeah, so this is about basic political rights. Um, you know, things like votes for women, uh, property rights, rights to an education, and, um, you know, like, say, rights over your own children. Right to divorce was also a big part of this, right? You know, to you know, to uh, you know, for women to have some level of freedom over whether to remain married to their husband or not. Right? <laughs> and a lot of this ideology gets encapsulated in the figure, um, in the media figure of the so-called new woman. And so the new woman is typically depicted in the press as a woman with masculine habits, right? Short hair. Yeah, maybe maybe short hair, you know, she rides a bicycle or smokes cigars or drink drinks whiskey, right? There's one kind of satirical um, photograph from a magazine from around 1901, I think. Uh, where there's a woman wearing pants and suspenders, um, and she's got her foot on the edge of the wash tub and she's smoking a cigar, while her husband is in his shirt sleeves doing the wash in the tub, right? So the new woman um, is um, depicted um, as this almost, like, almost kind of comical creature that blends masculine and feminine sensibility and like a lot of it has to do with like men's fear over changes in their status mm -hmm. or potential changes in their status should women get the kinds of rights that they are pushing for um, and second wave feminism arises out of something a little bit different Right? So second wave feminism, uh, we can date from the 50s through about the late 80s. Like so you can kind of like think about like, like the fashion that's attached to this um, yeah. as like pantsuits, and you know there was that period of the 80s where everyone had spiky hair and looked like boxes. Um, <clears throat> shoulder pads, right? Shoulder pads everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but the second second wave feminism was like first wave feminism, primarily a middle class and white movement. And the basic argument, the second class, the second wave, not second class second wave feminists were making was that women also have a right to personal fulfillment and to be the social equals and the economic equals of men. So 
So, for example, you know, a, a woman should have the rights after she's married to have a job outside the home. Right, shouldn't be expected to stay home and take care of the house and raise the kids. And in fact, like as, as we recall um, from even like you know this family um, and talking about other middle class families historically, was the mother even doing the raising of the children typically? Not if they had enough money to outsource it, right? Um, she's managing the household. She gives the servants their instructions, and she keeps the household budget, and so on and so forth, right? But she's dependent on her husband for money, right? She's only, she can only budget the money that he gives her. Um, and, you know, um, while she's responsible for the house, she's not actively doing the upkeep, right? The, it's, you know, this old angel in the house model. Um, so, second wave feminism, like, so the, the key text for this is a book by a woman named, uh, by the name of Betty Friedan called The Feminine Mystique. And <clears throat> Friedan, um, had got a, she got a bachelor's degree at um, one of the elite women's colleges in the Northeast. I think it was Smith. And she was working as a journalist. And she was going back and interviewing um, other Smith graduates. And the thing that she found was that most had become suburban housewives. And were feeling deeply unfulfilled and deeply unhappy, even though um, you know they had achieved, uh, you know, even though they were economically comfortable and you know had beautiful families and loving marriages and so on and so forth, right? They were still like they were not happy. So this idea of the feminine mystique, right, is kind of get it, trying to get to the root of why women who have the things the culture tells them to want are still unsatisfied, right? <laughs> yeah. and, you know, the answer that she comes to, it's like, hey, you know, we gave all of these women, you know, an, an elite education and then nothing to do with it, yeah. right? Um, you know, because, um, you know, raising, you know, sp spending your time entertaining small children um, doesn't um, require you know, a, a BS in physics, right? In fact, you know, <laughs> certain, a certain level of education um, makes spending extended periods of time with small children more difficult. <laughs> because as, uh, as Lessing notes here in the story, right, small children are often boring. Yeah. Or annoying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I will say that even, even as someone who's about to be a father for the first time, like, I don't, I don't love other people's kids. <laughs> now, everybody tells me, right, that, you know, the, there, there's the, you know, kind of like, like the kind of chemical mojo that, uh, you know, works, you know, with your own offspring, you yeah. know, where they, they kind of like, um, uh, you know, use pheromones to gaslight you into. <laughs> right. <laughs> Into loving and caring for them, yeah. um, and you know, for the first, at least for the first couple months of his life, I'll you know be just too terrified and busy trying to keep him alive to think about <laughs> much of anything. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I mean, like, that's, if if you're spending most of your time surrounded by small children, you're likely not getting a lot of intellectual stimulation. Yeah. Now, the other element of this is this change in living patterns that occurs in the mid 20th century, particularly with the, wide, the widespread availability of automobiles, right? So there was a, an interesting article a couple of years ago. Um, I, forget, I think it was in The Atlantic. It was written by uh, the newspaper columnist David Brooks. 
And I don't normally agree with Brooks about much stuff. He's a cultural conservative. Um, so he and I don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And I don't see eye to eye with all of his conclusions in this article either, right? But the article was called, like, was the nuclear family a mistake? And the basic point that he's making is that this nuclear family model that is promoted as the norm, particularly in Anglo-American culture, um, is actually a historical aberration. Right? This idea that you've got a mother, father, and 2.5 kids living together in a suburban house on a half acre lot with a white picket fence, right? This is actually not historically normal, right? This is not how most people have ever lived. Most people traditionally lived in you know, a multi-generational household um, and surrounded by um, <clears throat> either you know close neighbors, um, or it, many of who, uh, or you know people who were also you know maybe kin of varying degrees of closeness, right? So you know you might you know you're you know you might be live in a village where you're related to everybody else in the village, right? But you know there's you don't live on an isolated plot where no one is connected to you mm -hmm. except by geography. Um, and so, you know, Brooks's argument, and other people have made similar arguments before, is that this kind of this move to suburban, single-family, detached neighborhoods um, has created, uh, in part, the current crisis of loneliness, particularly for women, and also. Um, for young children who you know can't really because you can't really go anywhere without driving right and if you can't drive yet you are basically dependent on your parents to ferry you around but it also like like arguably or is it is often argued that this deprives um, women of the opportunity uh, if they're staying home with the kids to form the same kinds of social networks and social bonds that their husbands do. And we can clearly see this in the Rawlings marriage, right? Yeah. That Matthew has, you know, yeah, he comes home every night, but he has this whole social world that he's still attached to through his job and through their old acquaintances in London that Susan no longer has access to, right? Everything she knows about their old acquaintances, it seems she pretty much knows through him. She's stuck out there in the big house in the suburbs with uh, the hired charwoman every day, especially once the kids go to the start going to school, right? That gives her a lot less to do. Yeah. So let's kind of look at for a second here, the cultural construction of marriage here as it is described on like the first page of the story, right? So if we turn to page 901. And I, I really would, like, I was really not trying to turn you against marriage and children and things like that when I signed the story, but this is actually a really good example of ideology. Yeah. These kinds of these these cultural norms and values that we rarely question. Yeah. And we think, you know, if, if we you know if we see something wrong with it, it must be something wrong with us, right? This is a story, I suppose, about a failure in intelligence. The Rawlings marriage was grounded in intelligence. They were older when they married than most of their married friends, in their well seasoned late twenties. Both had had a number of affairs, sweet rather than bitter, and when they fell in love, for they did fall in love, had known each other for some time. They joked that they'd saved each other for the real thing, that they'd waited so long, but not too long, for this real thing, was to them a proof of their sensible discrimination. A good many of their friends had married young, and now, they felt, probably regretted lost opportunities, while others, still unmarried, seemed to them arid, self-doubting, and likely to make desperate or romantic marriages. So what's the first intelligent thing about the Rawlings marriage here? 
Um, they waited till their late twenties to get married, I think. Yeah, As they to just doing it. Okay. Yeah, they don't marry impulsively, right? They wait until they are of a slightly more mature age. They do a lot of dating first, right? They have you know plenty of experiences before marriage so that they don't feel like they're missing out on things afterwards, right? All of which is perfectly sensible, right? <laughs> but also feels like weirdly cold, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's... It feels scripted. Yeah. That's a good way to put this, that a lot of the development of their relationship prior to Susan starting to crack up, right, feels like they're following a script. Not only they, but others, felt they were well-matched. Their friend's delight was an additional proof of their happiness. They played the same roles, male and female, in this group or set. If such a wide, loosely connected, constantly changing constellation of people could be called a set. They had both become, by virtue of their moderation, their humor, and their abstinence from painful experience, people to whom others came for advice. They could be, and were, relied on. It was one of those cases of a man and a woman linking themselves when no one else would have ever, had ever thought of linking, perhaps because of their similarities. But then everyone exclaimed, of course, how right? How was it we never thought of it before? And so they married amid general rejoicing, and because of their foresight and their sense for what was probable, nothing was a surprise to them. And that's, we see a potential landmine there, right? Yeah. That, that as soon as I read yeah. that, because I was like, this, this is too good to be true. It's uh -huh. called to room 19. That seems a little, like, suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, the title alone, I was like, all right, it's about I to know. hit the fan. Yeah, I mean, like, the title suggests the kind of thing that Matthew actually thinks is happening later in the story, yeah. right? That she's, yeah. that, you know, one of them is going off someplace yeah. to have an affair. Right? As soon as I saw, or knew that this was about a married couple, and then I, I was like, oh, one of them's having an affair. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, then... but but not the one you think. <laughs> Although the one that you the one that you would think feels pressure to invent an affair as an explanation for her funny. behavior, right? Well, and I, I think that's yeah. She she doesn't need an explanation, right? Yeah. But other people do. Yeah. And I think like that's a big part of the weight that's on her, right? Is that all of these expectations that other people have of her. Whether it's the kids, whether it's Miss Park, Mrs. Parks, the charwoman who's supposed to be making her life easier. Um, you know, whether it's her husband, right? And I mean, even like that big suburban house, right? Now, you know, th this is just kind of quickly alluded to that they still owe money on it at a certain point, right? But in, in terms of this whole idea of like, you know, being like, this whole idea of prison, cage, and bondage. Um, can people usually buy a big suburban house just with cash on cash on hand? No. You gotta take out a mortgage, right? Yeah, you have to take out a loan. Which also means that you're kind of saddled to the place, right? <laughs> Until you have paid off that loan. So <clears throat> you are tied to that house by an obligation. Right? In this case, you know, to a bank or financial institution. Both had well-paid jobs. Matthew was a sub-editor on a large London newspaper, and Susan worked in an advertising firm. He was not the stuff of which editors or publicized journalists are made, but he was much more than a sub-editor, being one of the essential background people who in fact steady, inspire, and make possible the people in the line. He was content with this position. Susan had a talent for commercial drawing. She was humorous about the advertisement she was responsible for, but she did not feel strongly about them one way or the other. Both, before they married, had had pleasant flats, but they felt it unwise to base a marriage on either flat, because it might seem like a submission of personality on the part of the one whose flat it was not. They moved into a new flat in South Kensington on the clear understanding that when their marriage had settled down, a process they knew would not take long, and was in fact more a humorous concession to popular wisdom than what was due to themselves. 
they would buy a house and start a family. And this is what happened. They lived in their charming flat for two years, giving parties and going to them, being a popular young married couple. And then Susan became pregnant, she gave up her job, and they bought a house in Richmond. It was typical of this couple that they had a son first, then a daughter, then twins, son and daughter. Everything right, appropriate, and what everyone would wish for if they could choose. But people did feel these two had chosen. This balanced and sensible family was no more than what was due to them because of their infallible sense for choosing right. And so they lived with their four children in their gardened house in Richmond and were happy. They had everything they had wanted and had planned for. And yet. And this is where the, t the whole tone of the story changes, yeah. right? I also wanted to ask, so um, on the, I think it was the last question of the quiz. So after mm -hmm. I read this, yeah. um, I, well, I guess while I was reading it, I noticed that it goes from she to I, she to I. So uh -huh. she wrote this, right? Doris Lessing is the author. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. But if she's saying from, like, in, she's talking about the story and she's uh -huh. saying she said this, and then it'll shift from she to I, as uh -huh. if um, Susan is, is the speaking. one telling yeah. the story. Yeah. So then I'm wondering if she, like, is this just like a story of, like, I mean, maybe I'm thinking too far into uh -huh. it, but like, was this her suicide note? Well, she. Like Maybe it, not a suicide. Or is this just like, yeah. I'm like thinking too but I, far into Well, I, but I, 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 I think there is something in what you're saying here. Almost like like there's a kind of dissociation here. Right. Because right. like, like she's telling yeah. the story. It's mm -hmm. not like, at first you think that it's a narrator, cause, or yeah. a narrator that's outside of the marriage mm -hmm. saying, this is a story I suppose about the Rawlings marriage. She's referring to them outside of herself. Yeah. And then she'll randomly go into I. Like uh -huh. explaining it from what like she Like get was directly saying. inside Susan's head. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I, I think that like that probably relates to the fact that Susan is often like trying to see or trying to figure out what she looks like to other people, right? She's very, she's very much concerned about that. Like even like when she's, you know, she's like, you know, brushing her hair in the mirror. Yeah. And she's looking I at her face in the mirror, right? And like, this is what other yeah, me. yeah. It's like this is what other people see when they look at you know they mm -hmm. they see you know a a pretty woman in early middle age with long black hair, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I know that this is the face of a mad woman, yeah. right? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I I, I think yeah, that there there is something to that that we can kind of get this kind of this inside outside blurring. Yeah. And I, I think that you know maybe that's also. Do you notice where? Like speaking of inside outside blurring, do you notice where she tends to have her worst episodes? Like what part of her in property she? Yeah, in the garden, right? Why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. I feel like gardens are. Uh, I guess I I guess I. I feel like maybe it could play into, this might be far-fetched, but uh -huh. like the whole like prison cage bondage thing, and I feel like that can also apply to like the standard of the marriage, like so society standards uh -huh. yeah. are a prison, a cage, a bondage. So like society, like I feel like gardens are supposed to be a place where you can go find uh -huh. comfort and find like rest and peace and nature. So yeah. that standard that that's where you're supposed to go uh -huh. to find peace is like the standard of her marriage where it's yeah. supposed to be good, but it's not. Okay, I, 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 like, I like where you're going with that, and I kind of want to build on that a little bit and kind of think about that idea of nature, right? Uh -huh. Is a garden natural? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a garden is actually, it's cultivated, right? They don't just grow up on their own. Um, you know, they, they have to be, you know, you're, you're transplanting, you know, ornamental plants from other places. And you have to, you know, take care of them in order for them to grow, right? right. So it's ornamental. Um, it's a 
fucking hassle <laughs> it's, if you're not somebody who enjoys this sort of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a lot of work to maintain. And um, it's also like, because it's outside of your house, It's almost like, like something like, like you can if you put up as a, almost like a sort of facade, right? For right. other people to look at and to enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. I have this lovely garden. Mm -hmm. So I think it's gonna look like maybe emblematic of that kind of like presenting this kind of beautiful outside face mm -hmm. while inside the house she's running up and down the stairs going yeah. nuts. Um, you know, having all this frenetic activity trying to figure out what to do with herself. Plus, the fact, again, like the, the garden is made up entirely of transplanted flowers, right? Is this Susan, is Richmond, where the house is, Susan's natural habitat? No. Yeah, she's been taken from London, where even when she's not alone, she seems to feel more comfortable, right? She seems to feel more, like, more comfortable in the crowds in the tea shop um, and, you know, in the London shops and things like that than she does in the house in Richmond. But yeah, it's, you know, this, it, I think it's also kind of emblematic of this idea of being transplanted, right? Right. From some place where you were comfortable and happy to some place where you have to, you just kind of have to look pretty. Yeah. So that's, that's what, that's what I think is going on with the garden thing. But, and then the, the devil, the little demon. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the devil here. Yeah, the devil that bothers her. When she saw him for real, I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> She's not okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she, she yeah, she, I mean, it, it, it's clear, like, that she hallucinates him, right? She, yeah. you know, he disappears, she goes over there, and there's nothing there, yeah. right? But yeah, she's hallucinating this devil, right? And what's what do you think might be significant about the devil that she hallucinates? Um, he looks like a little Irishman. <laughs> he does look kind of Irish, right? Even though that's not explicitly <laughs> stated. Yeah, he, he looks Irish or Scottish. Yeah. yeah. With, with you know with uh, you know with, you know he's, he's you know with red hair mm -hmm. and um, a ruddy complexion, yeah. right? I but think it's. I, that part, honestly, like, I don't read, like, horror novels, I don't read, uh -huh. like, I'm not, like, very big on, like, I love horror movies and stuff, I've just never gotten into, like, books. Yeah. But, like, I liked the way, like, when she, like, explained the way, like, he just, like, gave her, like, that disturbing grin. I was, like, yeah. disturbed by it, because I could see it. Yeah. But I kind of liked it. <laughs> like a weird way, but I guess that's why you read stuff uh -huh. that's scary and watch yeah. stuff that's scary. But like, I you're right, and it, it's it, it's it's this thing that's it's like very like, sinister. Yeah, and it's the only, really, the only element of the story that is sinister in this way, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I, I think yeah, it, it's it, it's interesting too that she imagines this devil as someone or something that's external to herself that's trying to get in, right? Right. Right, she's worried about being possessed by it. And do you think it's at all significant that she imagines this devil as a man? Um, not as a woman? I think, in a way, in a way, yes, I also think, um, like, obviously, like, it's interesting that she does think of it as a man trying uh -huh. to get in because she's associating a man with, like, that problem, that, like, right. person, that's that thing that's bothering her. Uh -huh. But I also think that, like, if I were to think of, like, a devil in my head, like, immediately I'm thinking of a man. Like, yeah. I don't know why, that's, yeah, I guess we, it's, yeah, like, we, we've we, kind of been conditioned yeah. to, like, to that think of the, of the devil as, as, as masculine. Yeah, or like yeah. his little demons. I never, I picture <laughs> angels as women. Uh-huh. Yeah. And again, like, like, naturally, I mean, I'm like, there are like pictures of like men angels and stuff, but like, yeah, I but, but he's he, he, yeah, he, yeah. angel yeah. with women. 
Yeah. And like and, demons with men. And which, e yeah, naturally. And, and even when, when when angels are depicted as men, they're often kind of androgynous looking. Right? Yeah, and they yeah. have like very like pretty mm -hmm. boy like Yeah. Like Yeah, little long, long hair, feminine yeah. features, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Um But yeah, we, we, yeah you're right, we, we we tend to uh, associate devils and demons with uh, with masculinity. Um, I just I keep thinking of the South Park Satan, you know. This bizarre relationship with Saddam Hussein. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, th I think that yeah, that this this idea. I think there, there. I think there might be a couple layers to this this whole devil thing, right? You know, on one hand, like you know, I think you know, on the one hand, like you know, she feels like she is trapped here in part by decisions that are beneficial to her husband, right? By really a life that uh, is more congenial for Matthew than it is for her, because he doesn't have to be there all the time. And you know, he can, you know, he, he can he can stay in London and have his job and have his friends who used to be their friends. Um, he, you know, have his little affairs. I know, and he was really just having all these little affairs, and she was yeah. just going crazy because <laughs> <laughs> she was like stuck in a life surrounded yeah. by. Uh huh. And she doesn't even want to have an affair. I know. She doesn't. She want, but, she... but she feels obligated to pretend she's having one yeah. to give him some kind of explanation for why she's going to this hotel room. Yeah, it's, I think it's also interesting that she would rather tell him she was having a, an affair then explained to him that she was not okay. Yeah. And like that she did not yeah. know what was going on and did yeah. not feel good. Well, yeah, because if, yeah, if she tells him the truth, right, what does that mean? Yeah. It's just easier to... Yeah, she, she's not intelligent anymore then, right? She's irrational. Yeah. Yeah, intelligence... I think, you know, is associated in this story not so much with raw intellectual ability and more with making sensible, predictable choices. Yeah. It's about being reasonable. It's not about being smart. But the other thing, I think you know, she, she's thinking about this man trying to get into her, right? Trying to possess her. And I think that's also, there, there's, you know, I, I don't want to go too Freudian with this, right? But I think this is also kind of suppressed desire, right? You know, where, you know, subconsciously she wants to have the same kind of freedom her husband does. Right. The same kind of freedom she would have if she were a man. So she could wear an ugly red hairy jacket and poke, poke garden snakes with a stick. You know? <laughs> but I think in that activity too, like he's, you know, the, the, the devil is just, he's standing there and he's bothering something, right? Yeah. With a stick, he's poking at something. And like yellow boots. <laughs> I know, who the hell wears yellow boots, right? <laughs> but I guess that plays into like the fact that it really was just a figment of her imagination, probably combined with like multiple like her kid could have had yellow boots you know like yeah whatever, and it's just yeah. like her brain going so crazy uh -huh. that she just saw that and convinced yeah. herself she was so sure and that that's what was happening yeah i mean just about everything about this devil's appearance is improbable right yeah you know, it's yeah, yeah. you know yeah, pe people don't look like that people don't dress like that mm -hmm. but and there's also no sense of like this story having like anything like actually supernatural yeah, like, this is the closest thing to it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it, it is again meant to be taken as something that she simply fantasizes. Right. Yeah, this is. Yeah, this 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 is not a real devil. 
<laughs> but, yeah, change the whole but yeah, but yeah, 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 it might, but yeah, it would change the whole trajectory. Tra tra trajectory history. I mean, I think it is like like both a, a source of terror and a kind of wish fulfillment mm -hmm. for her. But yeah, we mentioned the you know the, the kids a second. Let's talk a little bit about the kids and her relationship with the children. She has some sweet kids. <laughs> And yet. <laughs> right? Like their innocence. Like, uh huh. Just, sorry, mommy. Yeah. Like, we, we'll leave you to your mother's room. Uh huh. <laughs> and like apologizing after, like, being too loud, going past the door, we forgot. And like, yeah. the older kid, too, like, took on that, uh -huh. like, kind of took on that, like, it's okay, mom has a headache. And I'm like, yeah, kind of. But uh, and that, yeah, but that, that, I, th I think like what's infuriating to her is that need for explanations, right? right? Why can't I just be mad? Yeah. Right. Why does like, there have, have to be to, an like, excuse? Yeah. yeah. Why can't I just be left alone? Right. Why do you have to explain it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yes, like the infuriating nature of this intelligent, sensible, middle-class arrangement, right? Where everything has to have a reason. Right. And I think, like, you know, like, um, well, let's actually talk about Mother's Room here for a second, um, and why that idea fails. So if we look on page nine, ten here, right? You know, after the uh, after the twins put her, put their arms around her from front and back, making a human cage of loving limbs, right? That the idea of a human kid like feeling trapped by the love of her children. Yeah. Right? What page did you say now? Uh, this is on on nine, ten, right? What it amounted to was that mother's room and her need for privacy had become a valuable lesson in respect for other people's rights. Quite soon, Susan was going up to the room only because it was a lesson it was a pity to drop. Then she took sewing up there, and the children of Mrs. Parks came in and out. It had become another family room. So even when she gets this little room of her own, right? Why does the room become like, why can't it just be her fucking room? <laughs> what happens here? What does it become instead? Um, just another room that they were in and out of. Yeah. Park or, or park, parks needed mm -hmm. um, to communicate with them. So she was in and out. The kids need uh -huh. their mom occasionally yeah. throughout the day. But, he, but he, even before that, right? What is mother's room? Is it Susan's private retreat? It's a lesson, right? right? It has to serve some purpose. It can't just be mother's room. It can't just be mother's room, yeah. It's a lesson for the kids in respecting other people's space, right? It can't just belong to her. And so as soon as that becomes the case, it doesn't belong to her, right? It becomes just another family room. Uh -huh. And I think, like, you know, like this, this is, you know, the issue here is, you know, when she's in this family house, right? There is no release from the obligations placed upon her by her husband and children, right? You know, I mean, even like, like we, uh, I think we, we mentioned this a minute ago, right? Like when she goes on this vacation by herself, she goes hiking in Wales, which actually sounds like a lovely thing to do. <laughs> but it's a misery for her, right? Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 like, 
the children keep calling, Mrs. Parks keeps calling, right? Because, and I think, like, this, this is an interesting thing here, too, right? Is that, you know, Mrs. Parks, the servant, right? Why do you hire um, a housekeeper? Um, I feel like in today's society, you'd probably hire one just because you don't want to do it yourself. <laughs> and yeah, you might be too, too busy. Then, yeah, it's, maybe yeah. like I mean, obviously, like she was too busy, but I also yeah. feel like it was kind of like normal. For yeah. The families that uh -huh. have money to just have a housekeeper do it. Yeah. Um, Especially in the days before labor-saving appliances, right? So, you know, when you didn't have things like automatic dishwashers, right. um, when you didn't have things like electric ovens, um, you know, when household chores, or, or even, you know, like, you know electric uh, washers and dryers, right? You know, household chores used to take a lot longer. So, if you ran a fairly large household, um, typically you needed a little bit of help. Right? Now, by 1963, you've got vacuum cleaners, you've got electric ovens, you've got, um, you know, <clears throat> you've got dishwashers. You, you think things like this exist by this point, right? Um, and certainly, um, the Rawlings are probably wealthy enough to afford them. But the thing, like, the main reason, right, like, why a middle class family hires, um, you know, a charwoman or a housekeeper, right, is Essentially, like to make their own lives easier. Yeah. Right. And yet, Mrs. Parks does not make Susan's life easier, right? She does two things. Like, one, she makes Susan feel superfluous. Superfluous, um, unnecessary, right? Um, extra. Okay. And you know, like you know, she, you know, she, she offers to do the cooking, right? You know, she she makes cakes, which you know, su or does sewing, like things that Susan could do herself, right? And in some cases, wants to do herself. And the other thing is that she also won't do anything without Susan's approval, right? So she also needs to be managed like the children. Because of this weird class dynamic, right? You know, Mrs. Parks is apparently very kind of respectful of that working class, middle class boundary and never wants to overstep that limit. And so, she's always asking Susan how she wants things done. And Susan doesn't really give a shit, right? Which is why she gets so annoyed with all of the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the phone calls and the questions and the need to make small talk mm -hmm. with Mrs. Parks, right? And I think, well, like, there, there is an element in this story of class snobbery. Right? that it's kind of made clear that Mrs. Parks isn't really a fit social companion for Susan, that she's just hired help. And that part of, part of Susan's problem, I think, you know, even though ultimately what she pays for is to be left alone, right? I think part of the problem is loneliness and a lack of appropriate social contact, right, or, you know, or, or, or what the story seems to consider appropriate social contact for her, right? People she actually has something in common with, um, whom she doesn't simply have to entertain. So, there are two last little bits that I want to talk about for a second. I want to talk about the scene near the end of the story where Susan goes back to the house and is looking in the window and 
watching um, Mrs. Parks and Sophie Traub and her youngest child interacting. But I also want to talk about the very end and, you know, like, you mentioned the idea of this as a suicide note, right? And, like, just talk a little bit about why Susan doesn't leave a suicide note. So let's go to page 918 here for a second. Several times she returned to the room to look for herself there, right, after Matthew was found her out. Like once, once it's not her secret anymore, it's no yes. longer satisfying. But instead she found the unnamed spirit of restlessness, a prickling fevered hunger for movement, an irritable self-consciousness that made her brain feel as if it had colored lights going on and off inside it. Instead of the soft dart that had been the room's air, were now waiting for her demons that made her dash blindly about, muttering words of hate. She was impelling herself from point to point like a moth, dashing itself against a window pane, sliding to the bottom, fluttering off on broken wings, then crashing into the invisible barrier again, and again and again. Soon she was exhausted. And she told Fred that for a while she would not be needing the room. She was going on holiday. Home she went to the big white house by the river. The middle of a weekday. And she felt guilty of returning to her own home when not expected. She stood unseen, looking and in at the kitchen window. Mrs. Parks, wearing a discarded floral overall of Susan's, was stooping to slide something into the oven. Sophie, arms folded, was leaning her back against a cupboard and laughing at some joke made by a girl not seen before by Susan, a dark foreign girl, Sophie's visitor. In an armchair, Molly, one of the twins, lay curled, sucking her thumb and watching the grown-ups. She must have some sickness to be kept from school. The child's listless face, the dark circles under her eyes, hurt Susan. Molly was looking at the three grown-ups, working and talking, in exactly the same way Susan looked at the four through the kitchen window. She was remote, shut off from them. But then, just as Susan imagined herself going in, picking up the little girl and sitting in an armchair with her, stroking her probably heated forehead, Sophie did just that. She had been standing on one leg, the other knee flexed, its foot set against the wall. Now she let her foot in its ribbon-tied red shoe slide down the wall and stood solid on two feet, clapping her hands before and behind her and sang a couple of lines in German. So that the child lifted her heavy eyes at her and began to smile. Then she walked, or rather skipped, over to the child, swung her up, and let her fall into her lap at the same moment she sat herself. She said, hopla, hopla, Molly, and began stroking the dark, untidy young head that Molly laid on her shoulder for comfort. So what's going on here? What do you think of this, this scene as kind of like narrated through Susan's consciousness? Um, I think that she definitely I mean, feels replaced, but it's... Yeah. Also, I mean, Mrs. Parks is even wearing her old clothes, right? Yeah. Um, it, I think it could be a few things, like probably initially feeling like replaced. Uh-huh. Um, and then kind of maybe, I don't know, maybe she realized that that's kind of her doing in a way, but then yeah. coming to terms with the fact that she sees that, I mean, the house is in good hands, her kids are in good hands, her kid yeah. loves that, loves Sophie, uh -huh. she's already, they've already moved on from her in a way. Yeah, yeah, that, you know, she is superfluous here, mm -hmm. right? That they're like, you know, it's like confirmation, right, that there isn't any real role for her in this setting, right? Yeah. Almost like she's burdening them by coming back and yeah. taking her rightful place as mother. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, like an intruder, right? Or like an outsider. Like, they're just, like this interesting image, I think, of the moth against the window pane, right? Mm -hmm. Just as she's watching through the window there, right? You know, the, she it, it thinks the moth, like just, beating itself against the window, trying to get in, trying to get in, um, and just hurting itself over and over again. And then, yeah, the last thing that 
that I want to mention here, right? Is on page 922, uh, and then we'll wrap this up because we're about out of time. Um, as she's, you know, resolving herself to what she's about to do. Right? The demons were not here. They had gone forever because she was buying her freedom from them. Like literally buying with the, sh the coins that she puts into the gas fire. She was slipping already into the dark, fructifying dream that seemed to caress her inwardly, like the movement of her blood. But she had to think about Matthew first. Should she write a letter for the coroner? But what should she say? She would like to leave him with the look on his face she had seen this morning, but now, admittedly, but at least confidently healthy. Well, that was impossible. One did not look like that with a wife dead from suicide. But how to believe him leaving she was dying because of a man, because of the fascinating publisher Michael Plant. Oh, how ridiculous, how absurd, how humiliating. But she decided not to trouble about it, simply not to think about the living. If he wanted to believe she had a lover, he would believe it. And he did want to believe it. Even when he had found out there was no publisher in London called Michael Plant, he would think, oh, poor Susan, she was afraid to give me his real name. So why does she decide against leaving a note or any other explanation? If she leaves a note, what does that suggest she still has? <laughs> okay, yeah, it's a, yeah, she's still thinking reasonably there, right? She hasn't yeah. fully embraced the irrational yet. It's like, okay, well, I have to provide reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't want him thinking I'm doing this for the wrong reasons, right? Mm -hmm. But all of those reasons, right, all of this rationality is also tied to obligations, right? She feels like she owes it to Matthew. Right. Um, to not, you know, to give him some kind of real explanation. And then, like, kind of like, like you know, I, I certainly don't want to suggest the story condones or encourages suicide, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a real kind of movement in the character when she just kind of thinks, ah, fuck it. Yeah, right? she just he'll think what he's trouble. Yeah, it's not trouble. Yeah, he'll think it's not my job for living. Yeah, he'll think what he wants, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's not my problem anymore. And I think, like, you know, that that kind of release from caring about how other people are going to perceive her, right? Mm -hmm. Shows real character development right at the point at which she then exits yeah. the story and the world, right? And I think like there is a kind of Joycean epiphany here Right, so you know, just as like you know, at the end of the dead, right, Gabriel Conroy recognizes um, what a right arse he is, um, and you know how you know he thinks of himself as this sophisticated, educated esthete, um, but he's really just a silly little man um, in shiny glasses, um, <clears throat> giving funny little speeches for his aunts. Um, I think that like that this idea that none of this shit actually matters, right. is Susan's epiphany, right? The big house she felt crushed by, um, the social expectations that she felt constrained by, right? Everything that caged her, none of that was ever actually important. And I think that's, that's the epiphany. That the things that society wanted from, that society told her to want, were basically bullshit. I can just little. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, again, like we've said about uh, you know ideology, right? You know, it's you know part of the part of the whole issue with it is that like you don't recognize it when you're in it, right? Right. Because it's just what feels normal. Yeah. I also feel like, I mean, I don't know, but uh, this came out in 1963. Yeah. Um, what were, do you happen to know, like, what people's responses were to this then? 
Um, depend, I, I don't actually know much about the reception history of this story. Um, because I feel would, like that'd be interesting to see, because now we can look at it and be like, well, yeah, obviously, like, yeah. don't listen to society standards. Because yeah. now everyone in our society is like, what everyone says, I'm going to do that, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy Yeah, this, this feels a lot less revolutionary now than it probably would have felt in 1968. Right. Right? 